Uh, okay, so looking at this from the perspective of like a Google Earth or a transparent map of the planet where we have like good satellite imagery and we can kind of like turn the planet Earth into a virtual world, I think that's probably an important international policy thing because I know some people are kind of hesitant. Some countries are kind of reacting against Google for having photographs of potentially sensitive things that are visible from outer space. But I see right now that as far as virtual worlds or metaverse stuff goes, I think one of the most immediately useful things to people or one of the most significant, one of the most significant things that will have an impact on the way that we view and navigate and understand the world will be this mirror world element where we track the real world geographically correct in real time and to make sure that countries are willing to collaborate to kind of share information across borders in some way I think is a really deep policy thing that I don't fully understand all of the issues around, but I think that that's an important thing that people have access to view what's actually happening on the planet spatially is something that my most fervent wish for it. Well, um, I would like to, okay, so here's, here's my experience thinking about virtual worlds. Um, I like user created stuff. I like platforms like Second Life where people can build whatever they want in three dimensions and pipe in two dimensional things that they like um, that are media rich. You can, they work with all the other programs on your system. Um, uh, I don't like it when companies constrain when they're, I understand that there's a reason to make certain things proprietary so that companies can make a profit off of you know, charging people to have access to their systems. It's really annoying though when you have there are talented people who can actually make systems better, faster than the companies that control them. Um, so probably that balance between open and closed systems and companies owning them or not opening them. Um, I think that an um, uh, open source model uh, around virtual worlds is probably one of the things that I'm coming to see is maybe the most important thing. Um, I know as an example using Second Life there were just so many people who could recreate the interface for that virtual world, make it so much better, easier, more intuitive for users, and yet they can't. And so um, that kind of thing I think interests me, virtual, virtual world specific uh, right now. Um, let's see, I, more, more hopes from my point of view. I, mean, I kind of think, you know, I, I, I think more about opportunities and I'd love to inventory all, all the roadblocks and talk with people about where they are, but um, I still um, probably as a, as a young, naive, optimistic guy, but maybe, you know, maybe this is the time that it's actually going to work. Um, I think that people are getting more empowered than they have been to hack up their own solutions for things that they don't like, show them with other people, get support for them, and then find ways to have open networks, technologies that they like built into, I don't know, made, made realized and distributed widely through the kinds of companies or corporations that maybe traditionally used to control things now have to soften to the demands of their large and talented user bases. So my, my fears are, my fears are not, not grave, well, I, well, I, which is kind of ironic. I think I'm less fearful because I think so many people are fearful. There are so many people who are willing to identify potential dangerous things or roadblocks and then kind of like fight to make sure that they don't happen, that my role can kind of be something different than mm -hmm. being scared of that kind of stuff. Uh, in virtual world space, uh, I think a lot about three-dimensional cameras and scanners. Um, I don't know a lot about the state of them actually. But I think that ability to use a single reference point, to point a camera at something and kind of paint that scene in three dimensions. So you imagine taking a photograph of something and instead of just having a picture, you actually have a technology that can infer distances. And imagine taking a photograph and then two seconds later actually sticking an avatar or turning that into a game space so that you can walk around and navigate it. Um, I think that that's going to be, right now you have a model if you want to recreate the world in a virtual world. The builder actually needs to like stretch out these you know, rectangular, rectilinear shapes to recreate the way something looks. It's a very time consuming process. And um, I imagine that'll, con that'll continue for a long while, but the ability to literally point a camera or a device at a scene, sweep it across, and paint that entire thing in three dimensions, I think is something that's like, we're not even really thinking about right now, but in 10 years time, that'll be something where people will be excited about that idea really easy ways to virtualize the world quickly, um, paint three-dimensional pictures of it, something I see. I, um, 
I'm still I'm still I'm bullish on the I'm bullish on Google Earth stuff. I think that the ability to and this is this goes back to this idea. I love this this book um, David Gowinter wrote in the early '90s called Mirror Worlds, and he has this idea of top sight in there. He calls it that the world's just way too complex for us to understand through textual information or vocal people talking to each other about stuff. We need ways to visualize how the systems of the world, how they interact, and really the only way to do that is to have these living digital maps of the planet. And I think that we're going to find out an awful lot about ourselves and the way the world really works. And we can kind of track changes in the world visually, see where information is coming from, where people are going, how changes in one place affect changes in another. And um, I think that kind of added transparency that comes from being able to see and search geographically um, and over time and to record our histories. So extending off that idea, the idea of like a, like a life log, um, I think that our lives are going to become more recorded. So I mean, I think they will become more and more trivial to record larger chunks of your life, um, make that searchable, so that you have like you know your whole life is kind of tracked and Googleable, and you can see what you do over time. So I mean, like my life, I mean most of my life is I would say is dark. I mean it was lived it was lived offline, you know, pictures and photo albums randomly from spurts in my life and. Uh, there's lots of mistakes that I should, that I'm sure that I make over and over again that I'd like to change about myself that I don't even recognize because I can't, I don't have access to them. So that idea of kind of in increased personal and spatial transparency, I think, is going to be a big thing for people, and we're and we will be using them. They'll be so useful. I don't think you can have, you won't be able to have a like a policy story anymore. Like Paul, I think, I mean, g democracy can be such can be such guesswork. Um, uh, especially when you, I mean, things are global now, and it's, it's so hard to tell what the impacts of a thing are when you actually do it if you don't have a way to kind of trace its effects in some way, more so than we do now before, besides something feeling like it's the right thing or wrong thing. We can't be very empirical about our choices until we can kind of actually visualize or see their impacts. So that's one thing. Life logs and more transparent planet through advanced Google Earth style technology. Yeah. I think you went beyond the novice thing. That's the. <laughs> I don't, that's uh, well, yeah, no, maybe it's maybe it's novice, but at the, you know, it's um, or maybe beyond beyond novice, but, um, uh, seeing something pulling up a pulling up a map of some kind, or um, or people, I mean, people love themselves. People love to see pictures of themselves and stuff. People love to see. So I don't think it's hard. I think it's a really easy thing to do is be fascinated with yourself. So like, if you can, if you can, I don't know, kind of learn along the way how to keep track of you know pictures of who you are and when or whatever, if that's made easy, I think people are going to love it. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at ourselves in that way, and what, what we've done and how we could change ourselves. I don't know. Mm. Um, yeah, OK, so not one word, but I think um, more and more we'll recognize that we're going from uh, tools to understand the, um, what we would think of as the, the natural world or like the human world to like creating New complex technological environments, actually creating a new, a new environment for ourselves. Um, I think that's already happened, but a lot of people don't. It's uh, that big idea really hasn't permeated too far yet. Um, we still think about technology as like a as a tool to as a tool to do things, um, to accomplish things. And I think that, like here at the summit, talking about metaverse stuff, I think you can almost define a metaverse as when we've thrown up a thrown up something on the world wide web, which is so far beyond a tool for managing our work and for talking to our friends and for doing science or understanding how the world is, um, to actually creating a, 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 new, a new world with a, a new life that kind of sits on top of ours, which isn't a tool to accomplish anything. It's actually a new place to explore and to travel into and migrate into. Um, that's not a one word thing, but it's kind of a, a one idea thing. So technology moving away from tool to, to a new environment, totally new environment. Cool.